this is where I'm hoping you can use the chat or pull up the chat. And when I ask you what makes a product great, what are the things, well, what comes to mind? What makes a product great? I don't useful. see the chat sound. Yeah, I heard someone say it's useful. Uh, you can say it or type it, whatever comes to mind. Uh, it, it does what it says it'll do. Uh, it's convenient. Uh, I want to capture as many as I can here. It makes sense. Uh, it's, uh, it's viable for the business, which uh, means, uh, probably means we make some money on it, something like that. It matches the mental model of the user. Uh, it's timely. I'm um, assuming it means uh, we're releasing it when we need it. It meets the needs of the marketplace. I'm trying to fill up the top of this and that may be enough. Yeah, uh, I want to get down simple. Okay, freeze, stop. That's good enough. That's a lot of stuff. We all know what makes a product great. Now, I want to point, point out that nobody said delivered on time or under budget or met our sprint goals or things like that because we know those have nothing to do with product success. Now, I draw this model all the time. I need to draw just enough of it that uh, you get the idea here that in product development or development of anything, we always start with these ideas. If it was a whole new product, the idea might be for that product. But uh, if you've already got a product out there on the market, uh, there are ideas for features or enhancements. Now we need to turn those ideas into something we can ship, a product we can ship or features or enhancements we can ship. We worry about the time or how long it's gonna take. We worry about the, the cost. And when we're talking about software development, uh, it's, uh, well, we're talking about not raw materials. We're talking about the number of people it's gonna take over time to build that thing. And we call those features enhancements or the, the details of our product, we call that scope. Everybody is familiar with this time, cost, and scope triangle. And we all know that this sucks. Uh, we, we wanna know what we can get and how long it's gonna take, but we can't. Uh, or the rule of thumb is you can know any two. If you, if you insist on fixing time and scope, then the bad news is the cost is gonna go up. If you insist on fixing time and cost, then the bad news is the scope is gonna go down. And when you insist on, uh, insist on fixing all three, then the bad news is there is actually four. That fourth one is quality. Fix all three and quality squeezes out like toothpaste in a toothpaste tube. Now, this is what it takes for us to build a product, but what matters is what happens when things come out. What we hope is that when we deliver this to users, those users are happy. We hope that they see our product. We hope that they try it. We hope that they use it. We hope that they keep using it. And we hope that they say good things about it. We hope that they say things like it's useful and it makes sense and it does uh, what it says. We hope that they say it's simple and convenient. Uh, we hope it matches their user's uh, mental model because if it doesn't, they're not likely to say good things. Uh, all those things are what matters. Uh, they're, all those things are things that you said and they came after you seeing, trying and using and continuing to use a product. When we build a product for internal use, we don't have to worry about whether users will try it and use it and keep using it. It's their job. They have to. This is true of internal products. This is true of business to business products. But what we can't make them do is be more efficient or be faster at what they do or be more effective. Uh, by effective, I mean make less mistakes or do better work. Those are the things that, that matter most there. I'm just worried about my focus. Yeah, I want to make sure that stays locked. Look, all of those things are the things that matter. If that doesn't happen, we don't get any of this stuff. And if a lot of users see, try, use it, and keep using it, that's when we start to feel it in our business. That's when metrics that we pay attention to in our business, like revenue and cost, that's when they, things get better. That's when business stakeholders get happy. And they're happy because we get things like return on investment. If lots of people, uh, if lots more people buy and use our product, that helps with our, our market share. If lots of people say good things, that helps with our brand recognition and brand awareness. Those are the things your company needs. 
There's a bit of a value exchange thing going on here. We build a product, our customers see, try, use it, uh, and keep using it, and hopefully somewhere along the line here, they, they pay us money. Um, they may pay us money indirectly. We may be earning it through advertisers or other things that we're providing value to also. And when enough people do this, that's when we get what we need from our business perspective. We all know how products work. I draw this drawing over and over to point out the difference between output, what we build, and what matters most, that's the outcome or what happens when things come out. And the annoying thing about outcome is it is not measured on whether you built things on time or whether it was under budget. We measure outcome and how your customers and users, well, we measure it in their behavior and even worse, how they feel. If they don't use your product or change what they're doing now by starting to use your product instead of something else, then we are not going to earn this, well, I'm going to call this stuff impact. We're not going to get the business impact that we need. Being product centric means we focus a lot more on the right side of this model than on the left side of the model. Now, in your organization, it may not work that way. Uh, in your organization, you may be spending all of your life focusing on this model. So I want to talk about a different type of product model. I want to talk about a product model where, where on time and under, under budget are what matters. Um, I'm gonna use something that's really current. I used to use my kitchen remodeling, but this is my backyard right now. I'm looking to my left and that is what I'm seeing out the, the outside. The, that big cat is still sitting in my yard because it's been rainy, they haven't done much work. I'm having major re-landscaping done. They're taking this solid hill and cutting it down and terracing it and it's a, it's a freaking mess. I hired this guy, Troy, to do the job. He's a landscaper. Uh, he has a team of people that works with him. And uh, look, I've already hired Troy, but so that my question might come a little late. Um, but I wanna ask you, what makes a landscaper great? If you were gonna hire a, a great landscaper, what would you look for? I'm gonna go back to this. Shout out or type. Uh, give me some ideas. Uh, design, meaning they can design uh, a great backyard. Uh, that's correct. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put down that they've got good, good ideas uh, for good, uh, good solutions. Uh, competence, communication. Uh, they, they're competent at building these stuff. They're good communicators. Uh, great. Uh, reasonably priced. Reasonably priced doesn't mean the cheapest or the most expensive, punctual, um, uh, which anybody who's hired anybody to do anything for, the, for them knows that. Uh, back to, I heard the vision, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and just based on their experience, they, they suggest things. Uh, they suggest based on their experience. And in fact, what we're leveraging is their experience. Uh, I, they know more about landscaping than I do. They know what's possible. Uh, I've got project management skills. This may, uh, may be enough. I'm fishing for anything else that's there. Uh, oh, and somebody wrote down on time and under budget. <laughs> yeah, um, this manages, this matters a lot when I'm engaged in this big landscaping project. So I want to explain a little bit more about how this business model works. And everybody knows how a landscaper works. Uh, this is a customer and well, my landscaper is a service provider or he's providing this service of, of landscaping. Now I'm the customer in, in this situation and I have a need, but, what, but what's most important is I can't do it myself. I don't have the equipment that, that Troy has to do all this stuff. I don't have the skills. I don't have the competency. Uh, so I need to hire somebody uh, that can do it. And well, in this case, this is, this is Troy. And Troy has a team that works with him that's cross-functional, that does a lot of stuff. And the first thing I do is I explain to Troy what I want. It's his job to, to, to listen and to understand. And then he needs to figure out how he's going to do this stuff. He has to figure out how long it's going to take. He has to figure out how much it's going to cost and how many team members he's going to need. And he's paying attention to 
well, the scope or what we agreed on building. Now, uh, this is where in this flow, he gives me back an estimate. And this is where in reality, I throw a WTF exception because the estimate that I get back is always horrifying. In fact, Troy was not the first person I went to. I went to several other landscapers that were competent and were recommended. And I was even more horrified at their estimates. Troy's estimate was the least horrif horrifying, but uh, it was still more. We still had some work to do. That's when we went into this back and forth phase we'll call negotiation. When we're doing this negotiation, look, the truth is I want, uh, I want more, uh, as much as I can get for my money. That's how I get value. But during this negotiation, uh, Troy, well, he has to worry about, he has to keep, uh, keep his customer happy, uh, but he also has to make money. Uh, the way Troy makes money is by marking up his people and his time and he has to make a profit. So he'll negotiate back and forth, but always mindful of how he's got to keep his business running. This is his, uh, his service business. Once we finally agree, I give uh, him an order and now it's up to Troy and his team to do the work. This is where he has to see well, this is where he will see how well he listened and understood, how well he understood the scope and how well he estimated the, the cost of doing this stuff. This is where he does pay attention to time and cost and, and scope and, uh, well, and definitely quality while he's doing this stuff. This is where he figures out sometimes that his estimates were wrong or he just did things wrong. Now, I hope when he just made a mistake, Troy will eat the cost. Because he's making a profit, he may absorb some of the cost. But if you were to look closely in my backyard, there's this big cutout. I'm looking to the left and I see it right there now. And the cutout is not where it was supposed to be. It didn't match what we agreed to. But Troy explained that there's a big water pipe running through it and you can pay us to move the water pipe, but that's going to be horrendously expensive. And uh, when things go wrong uh, that we didn't foresee, we pop back up into negotiation. We can uh, re-estimate, uh, but we go back and forth up this stack while things are, are going on. Uh, we didn't also predict the weather bad weather that we have up here and so things are getting delayed and I can understand why it's not his fault he doesn't control the weather ultimately when he was done when he's done I hope this works out uh, I will get a delivery or we'll call this done I'll approve the things and we'll pay him the, the last bit of money and I've taken too long to explain this I want to get back to this let's, let's I want to label the top line of this requirements and I want you to notice that this process looks super familiar because this is the kind of process we use in most, this is the kind of process we use in most software development processes. We uh, start by gathering requirements, we estimate, uh, the estimates are always too high because the person we're working with always wants more, we negotiate, we finally place an order, we do the work, and we try and uh, stay punctual and reasonably priced and competent, we try and communicate well, we try and do all these things really well. Pull back, I want to make sure we're talking about the right things. Now, this model works really well for Troy because Troy makes money on it. In fact, uh, let's talk about this as a, a, a service or a, well, his, his, Troy's product is not my backyard. I could ask you who owns the backyard when we're done. It's not Troy. Uh, who's responsible for whether I uh, see, try, use, and keep using my backyard? Not Troy. Uh, Troy is responsible for me being happy, and he's responsible for all these kinds of things. That's the way a service model works. Uh, Troy has to focus on making a profit, and he makes a profit by, well, he, he marks up the, his people's time. And I could ask you, what happens when I have unreasonable demands or I, I make demands for Troy to do more? Troy to do more. Well, we pop back up into negotiation, we pop back into estimation, and Troy charges more money. It's easy for Troy if I want more because he makes more. If Troy has too many customers and too much demand, also not a problem for Troy. All he has to do is hire more people because, uh, which isn't always easy, but he makes money on everyone, every, well, every job he does. And, you know, finally, if Troy has too much work, uh, well, if Troy has too much work, he can, he can say no. 
uh, I'm not doing that work, or he can charge more. Uh, in fact, part of the reason I went with Troy is because a lot of the other very competent people I was talking to did charge a lot more because they're competent. They've already got demand and they can do that. They can charge more. That's why this model works well out there in the real world. And again, we're familiar with it. But remember, my backyard, well, it's my product. It's the product I asked, I hired Troy to build. But my backyard for Troy is just a job. It's the job that he's doing. It's the, the, the job or the build to order that he's doing. The, pro, the backyard isn't the product and Troy is not responsible for, well, one of the things I'm putting into my backyard is this cool gas uh, fireplace where I can flip a switch, it'll turn on a flame, and I can throw logs on there and we can have a fire quickly anytime we want. Uh, uh, but Troy is not responsible for whether I use that or not, or whether it's as awesome as I thought it was. It was. Troy didn't even choose it. All the choices were made by me. Uh, that's a characteristic. Now, look, let me make this point and let's try to pull some of this stuff in. When you're paying for custom development work or custom building, the service provider is the product. Troy knows he's the product. And Troy uses mantras like the customer is always right. He provides good customer service. He focuses on listening and focuses on doing a good job. That's, that's what he's doing. And he does that because he's making money. Now, I want you to think about you and your team. Your, uh, and I want to ask how, what qualities are you evaluated on? Are you evaluated based upon product success qualities or these service provider success qualities? I mean, what I mean by that is when you finish a product, are you evaluated on whether it was useful or whether people actually used it or a return on investment? Or are you looked at your, uh, you know, whether you're reasonably priced or punctual or you looked at your communication skills? Uh, this uh, on time, on time, under budget, delivered what we asked for things. If those are the things that are important, then you might be being treated like a service provider or you might, well, treating the development teams and the service they provide as the product, treating you as the product, takes your focus off the real customers and the real products. Now I wanna describe how a product team works, or at least how it's supposed to work. Now, look, it all starts with identifying what product you've got or what that product is. Uh, if, if, if your product is a mobile app or Spotify, something like that, ideally, I'm not gonna talk much about scale, uh, but uh, ideally we've got a team that, that owns that product. They're responsible for that product. Now, Sorry, I'm looking at a couple notes here. I want to make sure I say everything I need to here. Look, that product is, it, it, unless you're a startup, that product may already be out there in the world. You've already got customers and users, and some of those customers are happy, and some of them are unhappy. And as a product team, you're responsible for them more than being happy than unhappy. So it's your job to listen and learn. You also work for a company. Your company has this responsibility of making money. And inside that uh, organization are stakeholders that are paying attention to metrics and they're trying to make more money for the product. Hopefully making more customers happy will do it, but it depends on the business model and other things. And if you're a product team, it's your job to listen and learn. How is my product doing? How is it supporting our company? And the result of all that listening and learning will be a bunch of ideas. And I can promise you there's always gonna be too many ideas. Your next job is to decide and focus what of these ideas serve more of the customers we want and we don't want to worry about the customers we don't care about making happy and which are the ones that are best aligned with our business objectives and that's hard and if you're a product team and you're responsible for the success of the product, it's your job to decide and focus. It's not necessarily stakeholders' jobs. Now if we pull any one idea out to work with, we've got to, well, discover or we've got to dig deep, understand that. We do that with analysis and design. And since we're not always sure we're gonna get those good outcomes, we test or validate those ideas. That's discovery work. And once we're com comfortable, we should build this thing. We do, well, delivery work. 
that is where we worry about time, cost, and scope. That's always important, but it isn't the most important thing. And then we deliver into the product and the whole thing starts all over again. Product development has these four aspects of if you're a product team, you're responsible for that listening and learning, that deciding and focusing, uh, that discovery, that delivery work. All of those are things that you're responsible for. Now, uh, you, you can see that this is a cycle. It's a circle. It's never ending. We're always doing all four things at once. Once you finish with delivery, you're not done. You start all over. You measure the success of what you just delivered, measure that outcome and impact. That's, uh, again, as a product team, you're responsible for all of that stuff. Now, your business stakeholders and managers or team leaders may end up treating you like a product. They, you might even be acting like a product. In fact, if you're using an agile process, your process might be treating you like a product. So I'm going to go to the agile manifesto. I want to want you to bear in mind the manifesto was written in 2001 and the people who wrote the agile manifesto, the majority of them were, uh, were, were consultants. They were paid to build software for a living and, and the majority of them were developers or engineers. And it, you're probably familiar with a lot of the agile values and principles, but look, one of them is this customer collaboration over contract negotiation. That's exactly the kind of behavior I want out of Troy, my landscaper. Uh, I, I want him to be a good collaborator uh, or I could be tough on him and uh, inf uh, enforce the bid that he gave me and, and not care about unforeseen circumstances. This customer collaboration over contract negotiation, that's exactly the kind of thing you want when you hired someone to do a job. But I don't collaborate with Netflix. I don't collaborate with Spotify. I don't collaborate with any of the product companies that I bought a product from. I don't write a contract with them for the features that I want them to build because I didn't, I bought a product. I did not hire them to build something for me. Now, another tell in the Agile Manifesto is the first principle, the first of 12 principles says our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now, if you're in the delivery of valuable software business, if, you're in the, if your job is building valuable software, then that makes perfect sense. But uh, and I could rewrite this for Troy. Uh, Troy could say our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable landscaping. And that would make perfect sense uh, for him. But uh, I don't know about you, I don't care how often my apps update. In fact, the more they update and change, the, the more annoying it is at times. And I didn't hire Spotify uh, to, to change continuously or deliver more features continuously. I hired it to play my music. We don't rely on products for that. So look, I want you to be able to very quickly tell when you're the product or when, whether you're the owner of the product or whether you're a product team. So let's talk about a couple ways to, to smell or tell when you're the product. First, if you and your team are evaluated based on the velocity of your work and not the outcomes your product results in, you might be doing a job. Uh, you might be a service provider. It, it, because look, what matters is the value we deliver, those outcomes, and velocity is not equal to value. The thing that's most important is your velocity and your company may be treating you like, a, well, a service provider. If someone outside your team decides what you'll build and you rely on them for their approval, that it's their job to decide on what the work is and approve or decide when it's done, you might be a service provider. If it isn't your team's job to decide how to improve their product or your team's job to make a call on what would improve their product, what would improve your product the most, you're, well, you're not the, you don't own the product. If you and your team don't know the outcome of your work, if you ship something and you have no idea whether, uh, whether your customer saw it or tried it or used it or they continue to use it, uh, you might be a service provider. If your job is done the moment you deliver and the stakeholders sign off on it, then that's the, that's the, well, you're in that kind of business, not the product business. And if your biggest risks are always about time, cost, and scope, and risks are rarely about whether customers really want or can use your product. 
uh, that's, that's a tell also. If you spend most of your time worrying about whether we can deliver this on time and little time or no time worrying about whether this is actually going to solve our customers' problems, that's, that's going to be a problem. Now, I talk about this a lot because even in big product companies, we, everybody backslides into doing this job mode or, uh, and, and it, it's bad. Uh, business stakeholders and managers and leaders, they start considering their, they feel like they've hired their team to build software or to do a job. And it's hard to get rid of this uh, customer service provider anti-pattern. Let me add one more uh, picture to this. Uh, if, if, if you're going to be, look, if you're going to be a service provider, I want to talk about a, well, I want to draw a little bit of a continuum here. If there's a continuum that describes the kind of service provider you are, and on the one side, well, one side I put the word waiter, and the other side I put the word doctor, I want you to behave a lot more like a doctor and a lot less like a waiter. And we, we know how what a waiter does we show up at a restaurant and we tell him all the stuff we tell him or her all the stuff that we want they bring us uh, whatever we want it, it ends up being their job to suggest more stuff because the more stuff they sell the more money they make but when you show up at the doctor's office it doesn't work quite that way try and show up at the doctor's office and give the, your doctor a list of your requirements uh, the prescriptions you'd like them to write or the, the operations you'd like them to schedule. Your doctor will say, that's nice. Tell me where it hurts. It's a doctor's job not to give you what you ask for, but to focus on your health, uh, to give you what you need. Uh, I show up at the waiter, uh, show up at the restaurant. Uh, they suggest all kinds of great things that I want to eat. I show up at the doctor, and the first thing the doctor does is to check my metrics or my KPIs. Uh, she'll check my uh, heart rate, my blood pressure, uh, uh, my pulse, or that's my heart rate, uh, my blood, heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, and then the annoying thing, I step on a scale and she checks my weight. And my doctor always tells me I'm too fat and my cholesterol is too high, and she tells me a lot of things I don't want to hear because when you say the word outcome to a doctor, they know what you mean. Medical outcomes aren't about whether they filled more prescriptions or wrote more prescriptions, they're about whether you're getting healthier or better. Doctors focus more on the outcome. And as a consequence, they tell you a lot of things that you don't wanna hear. Look, if the waiter cared about outcomes, the waiter would not be suggesting I have fries with that or suggesting dessert. The waiter would be telling me, you're looking a little fat and perhaps you should have a salad. Uh, that's, uh, that would make him a great service provider, but a really crappy doctor. Uh, uh, so look, be more, try and be more like this. Uh, treat your customers more as partners. All right, let's bring some of this stuff in. Look, uh, if you must be the product where you work, if there's no getting around uh, that process flow of requirements, estimation, negotiation, order, and delivery, if your team is going to be responsible for on-time delivery, try and move the focus. Even in product companies, we fall into this service provider mindset trap. And the big companies I work with, somewhere down the management chain, you have leadership and uh, that is focused squarely on product success. But somewhere through that chain of management, something gets flipped. And the team start worrying more about making their stakeholders or their bosses happy and lose track of actual customers and users. So let's talk about some things that you can do today, ideally without changing your process. First thing to do is just name or identify your product. If your team is responsible for a product, even if it's for a temporary time period, what is that product? Now this is pretty straightforward if you worked at Spotify or Atlassian and you know what your product is. But if you work for a bank and you say the word product, Inside of a bank, a product is a checking account or a mortgage or a home equity loan or something like that. Banks often don't consider the mobile app or the website or the, the, the applications used inside of, uh, inside of bank branches by, uh, by bank tellers and bankers uh, as, as products. And sometimes it's up to your job to point out that products are built out of other products. Just like your car is a whole product, but it's built out of an entertainment system and seats and tires and, and like your tires, they were a product manufactured by another, by, by someone else. Products contain products and in a banking ecosystem, a mobile website is a product. 
uh, one more example here. You know, look, a long time ago, I used to know, well, I knew people at Salesforce. And one of the things that Salesforce had in the early 2000s was this in internal application development platform. It was it helped them build applications faster. It wasn't until mid and late 2000s they started exposing that publicly. And now the, the force as a platform and tools like Salesforce Lightning and App Exchange, that part of their of their product, well, now it's a visible or an external product. It used to be just an internal product. Now it outperforms their their original Salesforce CRM. They were able to do that because Salesforce treated that internal product like a product. They, they managed it. They focused on outcomes. So look, give your product a name. If it don't, does not already have one, say what it is. Evaluate the success of your product today. Look, as a team, sit down and ask, is this getting used? What features get used the most? Which ones don't? You'll find that product companies are pretty good at, uh, you know, they pull together metrics on this stuff. Uh, they, they know, but look, even if you don't have metrics on this stuff, at least not yet, just anecdotally ask, talk about it. You may have to ask around. Uh, just trust your gut or talk to other people. Really get to know your customers and users. You may be only getting requirements through stakeholders or leaders, things like that. And I'll, look, I say the word customer and user separately. Customers choose the product. They're usually the ones that get the value from the product. It's their decision to use it. Um, and users are the ones who actually use it. We conflate these all the time because in a consumer product, you are both the user and the chooser. But in a business to business product, the people who chose to use the product, for instance, the people who choose Salesforce or SAP or even Jira in your company, aren't the people who use it every day. Make sure you know who your customers and users are, really are, not the ones that are handing you requirements. Talk about, as you're building something, talk about the expected outcomes. What do we expect to happen? We're building this feature. Who will use this functionality? How often will they be more efficient, more effective? How will we actually measure their success? If we talk about that or keep that visible, not just the requirements or what we're going to build and when we need it, that changes the conversation a lot. And then finally, re reflect on every outcome, everything you deliver. Uh, we use metrics and simple visualizations to keep those outcomes visible. I want to draw one last picture and then let's pull this in for questions. In companies I go to, one of the first things I will ask them to do, well, one of the first things I will ask them is what have you shipped recently? And I want them to organize those things they ship by actual effort. Uh, what I mean by that is how long did it take? Now, I don't want to know about the stories in the last sprint. I want to know about the features they delivered that people could see, try, use, and keep using. Uh, it, was the actual effort small? Did it take days or weeks to build? And you may have some features that took days or weeks. You may have some features that took a, a month or months, uh, some features that took quarters or longer. If they start organizing these things into a continuum, they can see, well, how much did we spend building this stuff? And what I'm looking for is actual effort, not what we estimated, but actually how long it took. And well, usually we'll go back and tag things. For instance, if we estimated that this would take a week, but it took a month, let's tag that as something that we weren't predictable on, or look, it took a lot more to build this than we expected. You're going to find that all the things you tag are on the right side because they, well, they took more time or more effort and you'll see the patterns and this helps to do so the first bit of reflection is every time you ship stop and ask what was our actual effort not on the story but the whole feature but now here's what's most important is talking about that actual outcome now everything starts uh, with an outcome of i don't know when we first ship it, no one has seen it, tried it, or is using it, and we just simply don't know. But uh, the, the question is to start asking. Again, we can only measure outcomes after things come out. Now we need to start asking, what happened? Now, what we hope for is everything bubbles up to the top. And the top zone, I'm going to call this the awesome zone. Awesome is people saw it, tried it, used it, kept using it. They love it. They say good things about it. And we got all the, the ROI or the business benefit we expected. And some of the features may bubble really quickly up to awesome. Now, the, the bottom side of this is the awful zone. 
you know about awful because people will complain almost immediately. You'll have to apologize or roll it back or maybe never ship it at all. But uh, an awful outcome is something that did not deliver the benefit. Some things end there. And well, there's a big no man's land in the middle. I'm gonna call the middle zone the, the thud zone. Uh, those are things that aren't as awesome as we expected or hoped. If we had done a business case on them, they didn't deliver our, all the ROI we expected in the business case. And a lot of times, if we'd known they were gonna land there, we might have not built them in the first place. And as we watch over time, uh, watch those outcomes and they take time, we let things bubble up or we start to see where they land. One of the things we quickly see is how few things end up in awesome, how many things end up in the thud, and how there is absolutely no correlation between how long something took and how good the outcome was. Little things end up having awesome outcomes. Big things can have awful outcomes. Things that we took way too long to build may end up having such an awesome outcome that no one cares how long we took to build it. Becoming more product centric gives you something more important to focus on, something that actually matters to your organization. Let's bring this in so we have time for a few questions at least. Look, product thinking helps you and your team focus on the success of the product you're delivering, not just the, the quality of the job you just did. Don't mistake being a good service provider for being a good product developer. And then finally, all of this, we're doing all this because your company succeeds when its products succeed, not when the teams internally just just simply deliver things on time. Ultimately, it's up to your company's customers that, that, that those are the things that drive your success. All right, that's where I wanted to end. We maybe got about 10 minutes to talk a little bit. And uh, Steve, this is where I'll rely on you. You've been watching the chat and I've, there's been a few questions that have popped up on chat and you're welcome to turn on your microphone and ask and yeah. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, minute. I think uh, there's a little follow up to what you were just talking about, a little bit of debate, debate going on. Ah, uh, good. Um, about the don't oh. know, that oh, don't honestly. know part of what you just drew. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, there's a couple of comments like uh, uh, is, are you implying an awful outcome is better than a, a don't know, or uh, is it referring to yeah. just where you start? So there's a few questions about that. Okay, well, that's easy to go for. Uh, uh, yes, I'm implying an awful outcome is better than don't know. Um, uh, if you're a product company and you're responsible for a product, uh, if I have no idea if anyone is buying or using my product, that's bad. Uh, the minute you know, if, if you know what's awful, and what parts of your product are awful, now I can start to do something about it. Uh, but the absence of information, well, let's, God, I hate to talk about COVID. Is it better to have tests that show who has COVID or is it better to not know who has COVID? Um, Great example. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think knowing and knowing you have it would be better than just not knowing. Uh, so yeah, it works like that. That seemed to resonate with people in the chat. Yeah, I do. yeah. Well, how, yeah, good and bad. <laughs> Not this awful example <laughs> to, to work with. So if there's, if there's any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, or uh, I've got the participant window open. Um, if you just unmute yourself so I can see that you want to say something, I can actually have you, I'll just call, call your name out if you're unmuted to invite you to ask uh, verbally. Uh, so I'm going to look at the chat if there's another question that's come in. Uh, so here is one written, uh, and you can probably see this uh, too, Jeff, but how does one evangelize what you're presenting? Oh, God. This is the one I wish. I spend so much time. I, I, I know this about banks from working inside of a lot of banks. I've got to teach again uh, next month to a bank in Australia. And this problem about being product centric is, is a, a big thing. Uh, uh, they're hiring me to become more product centric, but what they're dealing with is this undercurrent of, really not understanding what, a, what we mean by being product centric. How do you evangelize? I don't have any suggestions other than it never works to tell people what they're doing wrong. It never works to, uh, 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 it never works to belittle or reprimand people. I'll go back to those uh, five suggestions uh, I'd made that uh, identify your product, name it, talk about it. Inside of banks, 
uh, saying over and over again that the mobile application is a product freaks out bankers. They don't see it as a product, they see it as a channel. Uh, they see it as a channel up until the point it gets, starts getting bad app store reviews and then suddenly they wanna know who's responsible for that. Now it's a product. Uh, the, call out what your products are, keep moving the attention to uh, customers and outcomes and over time we hope, they'll, uh, we hope they get it. And I see organizations slowly changing over time. Um, don't evangelize so much as do the right thing. That's the only suggestion I've got. Yeah, uh, I'm this, just looking at something you said, sounds like culture challenge. Yep, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And everybody knows that process is culture, process mirrors culture. Super hard to change to an agile process when your culture is super not uh, agile. It's super hard to change to a product uh, layer product thinking on top of that. Uh, I've seen very good agile companies be very bad product companies and, and vice versa. Well, there's one moving up in the queue. It's probably a little bit related, but uh, this is from Lisa. It seems the development management and CTOs always go for the easy metric, like <laughs> meeting sprint estimates uh, versus uh, anything or versus outcomes for customers. Uh, how have you worked with development managers uh, to influence that? Um, well, if, if you can see my visualization, I go back to this uh, often a lot. It's a, yes, uh, see this feature here in Awful? We met our sprint targets every time with that. It was delivered on time. It was rock solid and it does not matter. See this one where we missed our goals every time? It is awesome uh, and it's okay. Uh, if you can't, you've got to make the outcomes visible. If, you, if those outcomes are visible, you can't get there. And then on that easy to measure thing, go back to this drawing. The easy to measure things are the impact. Your company is already measuring ROI and market share and brand, or uh, we sometimes measure brand awareness with, um, uh, with, with uh, uh, gosh, now I uh, suddenly forgot the metric I'm looking for, uh, net promoter score, things like that. So the easy things to measure are impact, and the easier things to also measure are these time, cost, and scope things. Did you deliver on time? The hard things, are these things. These are what are called the leading indicators. The fact when these things go well, it leads to impact. And it becomes your job as a product team and as a product manager to point out these outcomes or these leading indicators. If the outcomes are going bad, then in all likelihood, we are not gonna get ROI. Uh, might have lost the plot a little bit. Yeah, you've got development managers. And that's, uh, a development manager is often, look, IT has always been or traditionally been based on a service model anyway, and IT has historically considered itself responsible for building the stuff that the business asked for. The, the whole process is working against you a little bit. So your development manager, almost by definition, isn't focusing on products. It, it's, it starts to be part of that culture change. I can guarantee that if you were a development man manager at Spotify or Atlassian or at Salesforce, you'd be focusing on these outcomes. It, because that kind of thing is knitted through your company. Too long of an answer. <laughs> That's good. Somebody pointed out the DORA, uh, the state of DevOps uh, stuff. For people listening in, uh, it was De uh, Derek that pointed that out. The DevOps community has grabbed onto this product centricity stuff in, in spades. Uh, they're very mindful of KPIs, especially outcome and impact centric KPIs, and how, and what the, the thing the DevOps community has pointed out is that our ability to deliver faster helps with the outcomes because we can deliver faster, we can recognize when the outcome was awful, and we we can iterate it towards awesome and be, having good DevOps practice allows us to move things from awful to awesome a lot faster. Uh, it's small releases and measuring outcomes and uh, I like the person who pointed that out. Uh, that's that's uh, more, this is a, I'm talking about this because this is a trend. I'm busy because this is a trend and product thinking is the next layer above agile thinking that the companies are moving towards. Sorry, taking too long here. Yeah, no, I think questions. you're answering them. There, uh, there is a question about uh, making these drawings available. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, let me, um, we'll record this and the drawings will be, you know, you can snap them out of the recording. Uh, 
you'll be surprised at how shitty these drawings are if you see them later on. <laughs> they made sense because you saw me write the words, so you know the word I wrote. But if you try and show this to someone else, they're going to say, those are pretty awful drawings. Uh, but I can quickly photograph these and embed them in slides, uh, embed them in the slides that I showed you and uh, share, them, share them back. Um, so yeah, I, I can do that too. So yeah, the drawings are there. Yeah, but I have to draw fast enough to keep up with my speaking. So it uh, hurts the quality of my drawings. Delivering the drawings on time <laughs> hurts my quality. I'm looking at uh, having a technology. Yeah, I like, well, I'm liking the comments. Uh, Scott, I like the comments you're making. Uh, agree, thumbs up. <laughs> um, um, you know, so look, uh, I'm liking Carrie has something. I mean, the news industry and the company treats the news as the product, not our websites, or our apps. Again, same problem banks have, same problems telcos have. Does this uh, make my development team a service organization supporting the actual product? It does and it doesn't. Uh, I, so I love this question. Your first off, your customers, you look in the 21st century, no one consumes news without technology being part of that experience. Your mobile app, your website, those are part of your customer's experience. Not just the quality of the news, but uh, you have to look at the, your whole customer's journey and look at every touch point along that journey. Yeah, one of, them, one of the touch points is the news story, but the first touch point is the app they use. And 20, uh, if you're with a news company, I would in, encourage you to read the, the New York Times uh, report on technology and how the New York Times shifted over time from adapting themselves for a, to, from a news organization to, to recognize themselves as a technology organization. And we need to understand all these constituent products that lead to delivering the news. And it's no longer, you know, those constituent products used to be paper and uh, uh, newsstands, and now they're technology. And then there's all those internal products uh, that we deliver so that editors and people uh, creating and publishing the news can quickly create and publish the news. Yes, your customers are those editors and the, the users are the people creating and publishing and changing the news. And you have to be mindful of their experience, but it's not their job. Uh, to tell you what the best editing application should look like or what the technology should look like. Uh, you, they did not hire you to build an editing application. If you take ownership of the editing application, it becomes your job to make a good application. Just like it's not Troy's, uh, it's Troy's job to build, uh, to construct the backyard that I want. It's not his job to tell me what backyard I need. That's the, the product posture means look, you take ownership of the product and, and you take on ownership of your customer's success. And if you're in the news business, your customers include the people consuming news, but they also could include those people creating the news. Hope that helps a little bit. Um, uh, someone that asked a last question here and I'm worried about time. Can, can you share uh, some metrics that should be tracked by product owners? There's a long discussion about metrics, but the first, the, the trick to finding metrics is to ask, what is your product used for? Uh, for instance, if you were responsible for Twitter, well, people use Twitter to tweet and they use Twitter to read and then just measure that use. How frequently do people tweet? How frequently do they read their feed? And is it what I expected or not? For every piece of functionality you deliver, ask the question, who uses it, how frequently should it be used, and then instrument your product so you can measure whether it's being used. That's it. Uh, now we can also start to look at a pipeline, how many people saw it and tried it and stopped using it. That's useful. How many people keep using it every day? We can start to measure... Uh, I used to build software for brick and mortar retailers and we would always measure their efficiency. Were they fast at completing sales transactions and return transactions? Did they make more errors or less errors? Those are the kinds of things that we measure. Look for things in the middle, measure the usage because when you get this right, the ROI follows. Hope that helps a little bit. Excellent. I think that, that takes us to the top of the hour, Jeff. Yeah. Um, fine. Thank you for, Answering those questions. Any any uh, final uh, parting shots from you? No. Uh, yeah, darn. I think I've given <laughs> all my parting shots. Uh, yeah, my, I, more than anything, I'd like to get a read on, does this make sense? I, my problem is 
every organization I show up to, well, we, we talk about product ownership or how products work, uh, uh, how to do the right things. Uh, hear a lot back that, hey, this won't work around here. And the biggest thing I run into is is and sometimes it comes from agile is this service provider anti-pattern where teams consider themselves doing a job and i'm doing my best to make the this anti-pattern visible and help people come out of this mode and move into this focusing on outcomes mode and you know, i'm looking for simpler ways to explain that so i'd love to hear from anybody that says yep that made it simple i can i, I can use that to help explain things or no nah, i'm still not quite getting it or i think you could have explained that more simply Give me simpler ways to explain that. That's, that's the help I need from you.